so hello and welcome to this first video podcast by the Podmedics on atrial fibrillation. During this podcast, I'm going to talk a little bit about the epidemiology, pathophysiology, some of the important causes of atrial fibrillation, its diagnosis, and then finally consider the basic principles of management. Now the epidemiology. Atrial fibrillation is very common. It's perhaps most common in the elderly, but it's important to be aware that it can also occur in the young. It is also a significant cause of morbidity and mortality. In terms of the pathophysiology of atrial fibrillation, there tends to be chaotic electrical activity within the atria with occasional conduction through the atrioventricular node. This results in an irregularly irregular ventricular response. There are two problems with this. The first problem is that the ventricles lose out on the 10 to 20 percent of the cardiac output which is gained through active atrial priming due to contraction. The other problem is that conduction through the AV node may be very fast leading to fast AF and that this may particularly with individuals with hearts that have other pathologies cause ischemia or, or failure. The most important wheeler of atrial fibrillation is clot formation that tends to occur within this poorly contracting atria. The most common site for embolization of this clot is to the brain leading to a stroke or TIA but can also occur to the gut leading to a bowel infarct. Causes of atrial fibrillation is a real classic to be asked on a ward round, usually at 8.15 on a Monday morning. Do yourself a favour, divide up the causes of atrial fibrillation into cardiac causes and non-cardiac causes. The most important cardiac causes are ischemic heart disease and any type of valve disease that results in distension of the left atrium. Important examples of this would be mitral stenosis, and mitral regurgitation. The important non-cardiac causes to remember are infections, particularly pneumonia, metabolic states such as thyrotoxicosis and alcohol ingestion, and aberrations in electrolytes, particularly potassium and magnesium. The presentation of atrial fibrillation is completely variable and depends most importantly on the patient's cardiac condition. A patient with an otherwise healthy myocardium may be totally asymptomatic with atrial fibrillation, even if it is fast, or they may just have a few mild palpitations. Patients with otherwise abnormal heart, either structurally or due to a uh, cardiomyopathy or due to stenosis of one of their coronary vessels, may suffer from ischemic symptoms such as chest pain or failure. The most important feature to look for on examination, of course, in atrial fibrillation is an irregularly irregular pulse. And an additional feature that can be picked up is a variable first heart sound. Obviously, the most important investigation is an ECG. And there are three features to look for. Fine baseline fibrillations, lack of P waves, and of course, irregularly irregular QRS complexes. As usual, you want to do blood tests, specifically use an ease to look for those electrolyte aberrations we spoke about, or if you remember potassium and magnesium particularly, to look for cardiac enzymes because the um, atrial fibrillation may have been set off by an ischemic event or may be causing ischemia. Also thyroid function tests to look for thyrotoxicosis. You also want to arrange an echo to look for any of the structural valvular abnormalities or myocardial abnormalities that may be contributing to the fibrillation. So here's an example of an ECG of a patient with atrial fibrillation. If you remember, the three features are irregular QRS complexes, a fine baseline, and lack of P waves. Notice on this ECG that the patient has a degree of ST elevation, perhaps representing um, poor compensation for the rate. 
So, atrial fibrillation is exceedingly complex to manage, and the, the, the treatment protocol really depends on the age, of, the age of the patient and other comorbidities. What I want to do now is to outline some of the very basic management strategies. So, the most important principles are this. If there is a cause for the atrial fibrillation, treat it. And then consider three things, the pros and the cons of each in turn. So consider rate control, rhythm control, and anticoagulation. In rate control, we use a drug to basically control the ventricular response to the chaotic atrial electrical activity. However, as we, when we do this, we need to give the patient anticoagulation to prevent the formation of thrombi in the particularly the left atrium, which could then lead to clots. As I've said, we use drugs, and the three classes or types of drugs to be aware of are beta blockers, the most commonly used one is metoprolol, calcium channel blockers, that's deltiazem and verapamil, and digoxin. When we think about rhythm control, instead of just controlling the rate, we try to cure the problem. So we use drug or electricity to actually control the rhythm problem. Because we control the problem, there is no need, at least after it's controlled, for anticoagulation. There are a number of options. We can do DC cardioversion, which basically involves shocking the patient, and this always requires sedation and possibly a general anaesthetic. We can also do it with drugs, and the two most important ones to know about are amiodarone, this is most commonly used in patients who are known to have heart problems, and flecainide, commonly used in young patients with atrial fibrillation who have no heart problems. There are also some fairly modern surgical options that you can do, and these include AV node ablation and then pacemaking, or pulmonary vein ablation. Anticoagulation is very important when it comes to considering the risk of stroke due to emboli. And we know that using anticoagulants reduces the risk from 4% to 1% per year. The general rules with anticoagulation are, if the AF has a definable onset and has been going on for less than 48 hours, it's safe to cardiovert without fully anticoagulating. However, you would give a bit of heparin, say 5,000 units IV. If the AF has been going on for greater than 48 hours, you have a couple of options. You can do a transesophageal echo, to check for a clot. You can anticoagulate for six weeks, then cardiovert, or you can anticoagulate and rate control using one of the drugs we spoke about and simply be done with it. And this is often um, what happens in practice, particularly in some of the elderly patients. However, it's important to remember that warfarin is dangerous, particularly in that population of people. You should therefore always consider the contraindications and possible problems of starting warfarin therapy. Um, examples are uh, where, where you wouldn't use warfarin or include other bleeding problems. Hypertension, because when you add warfarin to hypertension, you considerably increase your risk of having um, cerebral hemorrhage. Um, adherence, some elderly people necessarily aren't so um, adherent with their medications. And also, if there's a history of um, falls, um, you don't want patients particularly to be on warfarin then. If warfarin is contraindicated or not appropriate, a less effective alternative is aspirin, 300 milligrams OD. So, in summary, AF is a common problem that's difficult to manage. It's easy to recognise clinically, both through examination and on the ECG, when you're on your Monday morning ward round, think of cardiac and non-cardiac causes. And the most important principles of management are to weigh up the pros and cons of rate versus rhythm control and to always consider anticoagulation. So thanks for listening. Um, if you enjoyed this new format of podcast, um, please do let me know. Email me, email me at um, ed at podmedics.co.uk or write on the um, Facebook group wall. Um, I hope to see you soon and thanks for listening.